Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Camille looked at the homeless man from inside the car. Had she spent 16 years thinking of him as her closest, dearest person? How could this have happened to her? This would never have happened if her mom, her real mom, had been alive. Evelyn looked at herself in the mirror. She thought she looked disgusting. Her tummy was already treacherously visible. Her face became a text pregnancy clearly did not color her. And they say pregnant women have some kind of special beauty. That's not her. Father entered the room with the entourage. How are you doing? I don't know. I think I'm very fat. And the dress fits like a cow. Nonsense. Daughter, you're the most beautiful. Look what I brought you. Her father held out a black box covered in velvet. Evelyn leisurely opened it. Inside lay a necklace. Dad, how beautiful is it? Are those real diamonds? She couldn't take her eyes off the jewelry. Of course, my real daughter deserves it. Let me help you put it on. The stone shone around the girl's neck. Her father put his arm around her and asked her quietly, Are you sure you're doing the right thing? It was not the first time he had asked her that question. You know I don't like your choices. That Stephen of yours is a tomboy and a slacker. And you've got a kid to raise. You've got to live with him. My mother and I will help you, of course. But my daughter's husband must be wealthy and provide for his family. I'm not sure about Stephen. Dad, he's a good kid. We just need time. Stephen will do fine. He's smart. Well, you know, you just know that mom and I are always here for you and we'll help you with anything. You just have to ask. He put his arms around his daughter and pulled her close. At that moment, Evelyn felt like a bird in a cozy nest. Her father had always had a heart for her. She had grown up in absolute love and care. Dad's chain of stores brought in an excellent income. The family didn't need anything. Evelyn studied at the best grammar school, where together with her the basics of science learned the daughters of factory directors, businessmen, politicians. She met Stephen at a club. She and the girls had gone there after graduation. They wanted to dance. The champagne made her dizzy. A cute guy asked her to dance. You miss me? He asked Evelyn. No, on the contrary, it's very nice here, she replied, laughing. And I know places where it's much better. And where is this place? Do you want me to show you? There was a twinkle in the boy's eye. I'd like that. They left the club in anticipation of the adventure. Evelyn was ready for anything crazy. The guy led her to the bike. Let's go, shall we? Get on and hold on tight. She sat behind him and hugged his chest. They raced through the nighttime city, past houses, parks, down an empty highway. The wind fanned their dress. Evelyn played with her hair. She wasn't scared and wanted to laugh at the top of her voice. Stephen took her hand and they ran up the stairs of some house. They ran until they were on the roof. The view of the city was incredible. Evelyn had never been on a rooftop in her life. She gazed, mesmerized, at the lights that illuminated the streets. It's so beautiful here, she said quietly. The guy pulled a bottle of champagne out of his backpack, and when he had time to bring wine with him, flashed through her mind. Here you go. He held out a plastic cup of champagne to her. Let's get acquainted. I'm Stephen, and I'm Evelyn. The girl laughed for some reason. Everything that was happening to her now seemed to be a very exciting madness. A strange guy on the roof of a high-rise, champagne. You know, it's not the first time I've been here, Stephen said. I come when I want to be alone. And today I suddenly wanted to show you this place. I noticed you and your friends at the bar. You don't look like them at all. Standing out in some special way. Evelyn didn't know what to say. Champagne surrounded her head treacherously. Her thoughts were jumbled and confused. Suddenly, Stephen jumped up and stood on the edge of the roof. Would you like me to walk along the edge for you now? No, no. Tear, and quickly you'll fall off. The girl was scared out of her wits. She ran up to him and took his hand. The guy jumped down, looked at Evelyn with an attentive gaze. They kissed. Evelyn had never been so happy before. 
Does it really happen like this? She thought, seriously considering that there was no one else on earth right now but the two of them. By the time the bike slowed down in front of Evelyn's house, the sky was already screaming. Shy rays of sunshine. The girl didn't want to blurt out her arms, but hugged Stephen tightly. Everything that had happened to her this day overrode all other events. And after all, today was the graduation in her gymnasium. She had finished her studies, and adult life was ahead of her. Her parents wanted to send her to the capital to study. But now Evelyn realized that she didn't want to go anywhere. She wanted to see this guy every day, to be near him, to feel his lips on her face, as it was this night. As goodbye, he kissed her again. Evelyn walked into the house where everyone was still asleep, but she didn't feel like lying down. The girl walked to the kitchen to make coffee. No, she was definitely the crazy one. A complete stranger seemed almost like her own. The kind of guy every girl dreams of. She had given herself to him on the roof, under the glitter of the night stars, and now she could feel his touch all over her. Suddenly, Evelyn realized that they hadn't even made an appointment to meet. Would she never see him again? The girl didn't notice her father entering the kitchen. What's on your mind, beautiful girl? Said Christopher, a peck on the daughter's cheek. Good morning, daddy. Would you like some coffee? I'd love some. How was the party? We had a great time at the club dancing. Dad, I met a guy. His name is Stephen. What kind of guy is that? He's very nice. The girl spun around the table in the kitchen. He's the greatest guy in the world. The best guy in the whole wide world. I think, no, I'm pretty sure. I love him. Well, it's a little early for that kind of statement. Don't you think? Dad was drinking coffee and put the cup on the table. You just met him and you're already in love with him. Your mom and I, Evelyn, interrupted her father. I know, I know. You've known each other since you were kids, played in the same sandbox and went to the same school. I've heard it a hundred times in history, but love at first sight does happen. Now I know for a fact that it can happen. Okay, maybe it does. Christopher hugged his daughter. I gotta go to work. What are you planning on doing today? Uh, nothing. I'm gonna sleep in, enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy it. Just don't forget the entrance exams are coming up. Rest is rest, but university entrance exams aren't off the table. Evelyn went up to her room and collapsed on her bed. She wanted to sleep. As she fell asleep, she thought about the guy who had burst into her life so unexpectedly. It was quiet in the dormitory of the industrial technical school. Most of the students had gone home for the vacations. Stephen walked into his room that he shared with his friend Rick. All he wanted was to sleep and let no one dare even wake him up. He had to go to work in the evening. The guy worked at a nightclub as a bartender. He'd come to town two years ago. His father, mother, and three sisters stayed in the village. Stephen was the eldest child in the family. He had a hard time. His father was always making him plow and work in the mud, and his mother was always shouting, Stephen, look after your sisters, Stephen, bring water. Stephen, firewood. Having finished nine grades, he knew for sure that he had to go to technical school to leave the village and live a city life. And so it turned out to be. Now he studies, lives in the city and works to have something to live on and go out with girls. Girls in the city are not like in the village. There you could finish any girl with a bouquet of wildflowers. And these urban myths like to party hard. Take this girl he spent tonight with. It is immediately obvious that she is from a rich family, definitely not poor and lives in such a beautiful house. Their village house, compared to the good ones from the branch, is a barn on chicken legs. I wonder who her parents are. Stephen fell asleep without even undressing. Why hadn't she given him her phone number? Evelyn stared out the window and wondered how she would ever see Stephen again. What did she know about him? Not much. Just that he's the coolest guy in the world and has a bike. Now it seemed to her that if she didn't see him again, she would simply die, cease to exist. She couldn't live without him. But it's impossible to find a man you know almost nothing about in the city. 
even her father, for whom she thought nothing was impossible, wouldn't be up to the task, nor would she want to involve him. The girl's mother came into the room. She's awake. Come downstairs. I'll feed you senior year, she said. The mom set up lunch in the dining room. And it was strange, because they only ate in the dining room when they were all together. At dinner, mom poured soup into a bowl. Well, tell me about it. She smiled. Dad said, did you meet a boy? Yes, mommy, I did. And he's very nice. We were on the roof with him, and the sky was so starry, just all sprinkled. What roof? You could have fallen off. It's dangerous. Mommy was worried. But Evelyn laughed so hard she didn't want to lecture. He and I also rode a bike through the city at night, and there was no one around, she continued. Looking at her happy face, Emily smiled too. Just, you know, I don't know if I'll ever see him again. I haven't even had a chance to find out anything about him. I don't have his cell phone number or where he lives. I don't know. Just his name. And it's the most wonderful one. Stephen. But if he likes you too, he'll find you, Mom said. Don't worry. Evelyn was relieved by her mother's words. In the evening, her friend Vanessa dropped by. They had been friends for a long time. They were in the same class and shared secrets. Kelly's parents had gone to live abroad. After graduating from high school, she had to leave too. In the meantime, she lived with her grandmother. They set up in the garden next to the swimming pool. Mom brought fruit and juice. She asked Kelly how her parents were doing. After receiving a formal answer that everything is fine, removed her friend, planted apples, and asked, and where did you disappear yesterday? I searched you. You have no idea where I was until this morning. Conspirators, Evelyn began. She told Vanessa everything in great detail and even about her history with the guy. Her friend listened, eyes wide with surprise. You're kidding. You don't know him at all. Sleeping with a guy you don't know very well, who you're seeing for the first time and on a rooftop. I'm shocked. You never seem like the crazy type. They both laughed. Except now I don't know if I'll ever see him again. You know, I'd like to go out with him and have him be my boyfriend and mine alone. But I don't know where to find him. You're funny. What do you know about him? A friend asked me. What's his name? That he has a bike. And she didn't know anything else about Stephen. Let's be logical, Vanessa suggested. You met at a club, right? So Evelyn didn't understand what Vanessa was getting at. He probably goes there, right? So that's where we should look for him, she summarized. What if he went there by accident and doesn't hang out there at all? I don't think so. Random people don't go to the club at night or hardly at all. So there's a 99% chance that's where you'll find him. Let's go to the club on Friday. Maybe you'll get lucky, Evelyn cheered up. She had some hope that she would see Stephen again. The music was playing loudly in the club. The girls were seated at a table on a sofa. Evelyn stared intently into the crowd of dancers, trying to make out a familiar silhouette. Stephen wasn't in it. I'll go order us a chick cocktail, her friend said and headed for the bar. Evelyn followed her with a glance. Suddenly she saw him behind the bar. He was walking around something by the glass. The girl couldn't believe her eyes. Finding Stephen, seeing him again was easy. Turns out he works as a bartender at this club. Her heart rolled frantically. Trying to hide her excitement, she followed her friend to the bar. Hey, Stephen. She tried to shout over the music. The guy looked at Evelyn. His gaze was confused, as if he didn't recognize her. I'm Evelyn. And hi. How are you? I'm just here to hang out. I'm meeting a friend of mine. This is Vanessa. The friend looked at the light and the guy behind the bar in surprise. What are you drinking? Asked Stephen. Let's have a margarita, shouted Vanessa. The guy poured the cocktails and put a straw in each glass. Evelyn didn't know what to say or how to act. She just stared at him. Girls, why don't you let us in? There was a bunch of guys standing in the back. Apparently, they wanted to order too. The girls went back to their table. That's your Stephen. Wow, 
He's the bartender. He works here. Apparently, Vanessa was cooking, and Evelyn kept looking at the guy. She didn't understand his reaction. Was he not happy to see her? Look, he's all right. He's handsome. Now I see what you mean. I'd run away with a guy like that, too. Kelly's words echoed. I need to talk to him, Evelyn said and headed for the bar. What exactly to say, she didn't know. Stephen, it's so good to see you, she began. I thought I'd never see you again. The earth is round, the guy replied. Sooner or later we would have met anyway. Maybe we could go for a walk sometime. When did you get off? Today until the morning behind the bar Stephen spoke without looking at her, wiping his glass with a snow white napkin. And tomorrow? Could we meet tomorrow? Evelyn asked. Or the day after tomorrow? A tall, slender brunette in a red dress that barely covered her firm buttocks approached the bar. Another strongman clash, groan. Look, someday some daddy will show up and kick your ass. The brunette laughed. Tell me again. Look, I'm busy. So can I wait for you? Why? To go on that roof again, Evelyn said uncertainly. Suddenly, the brunette intervened in the conversation. Oh, you're begging for it too. Already got you on the roof. She laughed dearly. It's the roof. What a lot of girls I haven't seen. And all because the dorm is strict. The super doesn't let girls in his room. And Stephen's really into making out with girls. Yes, Stephen. Evelyn felt dizzy and her legs felt woozy. She looked at the guy and he pretended nothing was happening. So, uh, you got a date. He gave you his phone number. Her friend peppered Evelyn with questions as she returned to their table. She didn't immediately notice that the girl was about to burst into tears. The will to cry she'd given on the street. The world had crumbled. She had fallen in love with a guy who didn't care. He wasn't going to date her at all, and wasn't happy to see her again. What a fool she was. Where were her brains when she climbed up on that damn roof? Vanessa tried her best to calm her friend down. Come on, I'm not crying. How many times? Yeah, it hurts. He turned out to be a common womanizer who goes through girls. But he's not the only Stephen on earth. You'll meet a great guy who'll love you. All right, come on. Translate. My face is all swollen and my mascara is smeared. But Evelyn didn't seem to be deterred. This was the first cruel and very painful disappointment of her life. Her heart was bursting with resentment to her grief. She realized more and more clearly that she loved Stephen and needed no one else. Evelyn, you can't do this. You haven't been out for a month, sitting at home alone. You're not into anything at all. Emily hugged her daughter, ran her hand through her loose hair. You should go to Vanessa's, take a walk together somewhere. Evelyn didn't really want to go anywhere and didn't want to see anyone. But Vanessa had come. Her voice rang out in the hallway. A moment later, she flew into the room. Hello, Aunt Emily. I'm here to see Evelyn. It's very good of you to come. She's sitting all alone. I'll bring you some donuts. She baked them herself this morning, and Evelyn hasn't even eaten one. Emily went into the kitchen. Vanessa managed to get her friend out for some fresh air. She was happily flying donuts, carefully brought by Emily, drinking juice. Very tasty. You should not eat it, she said. I don't want to. It makes me sick. Her friend stopped chewing and looked carefully at the branch. How long has it been? She asked, lowering her voice almost to a whisper. I don't know how long, Evelyn. A long time, I said. No, why? You're not the one who's not the one. Are you pregnant by any chance? When was your last period? Bought before prom. Vanessa put the donut back on the plate. Let's go, she tugged on Evelyn's arm. Where are you taking me? Get off. The girl resisted. Where to where? Let's go to the drugstore, buy a pregnancy test, and check everything at once. Evelyn stopped. Are you serious? She asked her friend. Her eyebrows went up. Of course I'm serious. You've slept with Stephen on the roof. And that can sometimes get you pregnant. She said indignantly. Couldn't Evelyn have thought of that? Delayed. Nauseous. It's been a month. 
It's clearer than I thought. But I'll have to check it out, just to be sure. Back from the drugstore, Evelyn locked herself in the bathroom. But what had Vanessa done in there? I couldn't wait to find out the result, but come out already. Something stuck in there. Evelyn stared at the test. It showed a clear two-stripe pattern. She's pregnant. What do I do? How do I tell their parents? She's having a baby. All sorts of thoughts went through her head, all with a question mark and not one clear answer. She came out of the bathroom, handed the test to Vanessa. She looked at the test. Gotcha, she said. You have to tell your father. He loves you very much. He'll figure out what to do. He'll kill me, said Evelyn. He won't, you'll see, but he'll kill your Stephen. Evelyn suddenly snapped out of her stupor. Don't tell my father about Stephen. It's my own fault. Give me your word you won't. Vanessa wasn't sure she should swear not to give away the name of the scoundrel who wanted Evelyn Christopher. But no, he'd have to answer for what he'd done. Sorry, girlfriend, I can't give you that word. No offense, but if they ask me about Christopher, I'll give that Stephen guy a piece of my mind. When Vanessa went home, Evelyn continued to sit on the bed, staring at the test. What had she done? In the evening, there was a serious conversation with her parents. At first, confused, Christopher pulled himself together and began the questioning. Who he is, where he lives, who his parents are, where he studies. Where did you meet him? How long have you been dating? We are not dating. Quietly said the daughter, it was one time. It's getting worse by the hour. Where can I find him? The father started to raise his voice. Calm down, don't you see? Is your daughter upset at all? Emily tried to calm her husband down. Tell us everything, sweetie. Don't be afraid of anything. There's nothing to tell, screamed Evelyn, jumping out of her chair. There's nothing to tell. We just slept with him. I thought he liked me. That we were gonna date. Turns out I was just another girl in his life who fell for him like a fool. Daddy promises you won't do anything bad to Stephen. This is what I wanted. This is what I wanted. I wanted to have a baby at 17 and put my schooling on hold. I wanted to be a single mom. No, of course your mom and I will be there for you and support you. But this is so wrong. I can't even find the words. Who's that bastard? Tell me. Don't. Daddy, I don't want to hurt him. I love him. And I'm going to have a baby. That evening, everyone was thoughtful. In the morning, Evelyn didn't show up for breakfast, saying she had a headache. Emily poured a glass of water, pulled some pills from the medicine cabinet, and quietly entered her daughter's room. Take a pill, she told Evelyn. She obediently took the medicine and drank the glass of water. Daughter, talk to me. I see how you are suffering. And it's very hard to watch. Let's talk. Mommy, I love him so much. Who? The baby. So it's not even born yet. Mom asked in surprise. No, I love Stephen. You don't know how good he is. But my daughter, how can you know if he's good or not if you've only been with him once? You don't even know him at all. No, I think I've known him for a long time. He doesn't know me. If we'd met a few times, he'd realize I'm kind and I love him very much. Of course, the sweet mom hugged Evelyn and cuddled her like she did when she was a little girl. A doctor's appointment revealed that there was a threat of miscarriage. I would recommend an inpatient stay, the doctor said, putting her hands under the running water in the wash basins. Tell me, doctor, is it possible to follow all the recommendations, treatment at home? I do not want my daughter to lie alone in the hospital. We have all the conditions at home. You just tell us what to do, but it's up to you to do it at home. Give your daughter complete rest and no exertion. Good nutrition, more vitamins. I'll prescribe the drugs, buy them at the pharmacy. And most importantly, hear me out. The doctor looked at Evelyn carefully. Don't be nervous, don't worry. Only positive emotions. And then everything will be fine. You'll have a healthy and beautiful baby on time. Thank you. Evelyn and her mom went home after receiving the necessary recommendations. And in the evening, Emily turned to her husband. I'm worried about Evelyn. She's so sad 
she's worried about Stephen. And she shouldn't be nervous. The doctor said she needs positive emotions. I don't know what to do to make her happy. It's not working. I know, Christopher replied. What are you up to? The wife was worried. You'll see it will be her positive emotions. Let's go to bed. It's late. Stephen did not immediately realize what a man is shaking him by the shoulders. He was sleeping off after the raucous party that he and his friends had yesterday. Who's that? What do you want? Sleepily he asked Amble the man and started and moved aside. Now another man appeared in front of the head. He looked at the guy carefully, without taking his eyes off. Are you a... I take it, Stephen? He asked. But Stephen, the boy could not understand what he wanted from him. Remember Evelyn, the one you had fun with on the roof a month and a half ago. Stephen looked at the unexpected guest and did not understand anything. What Evelyn he'd been with on that rooftop. And some of them he hadn't even asked her name. What was going on? The man asked again, raising his voice. Do you remember her? I'm asking. Stephen began to come to his senses, scrolling mentally in his head who could it be. Evelyn, wasn't it the girl who came to his bar later? So naive and funny. Did she think he wanted to get serious with her? No, but she seemed nice, so pretty. He drove her to her house afterwards, surprised her. She must live pretty well. I remember. What do you want? Listen to me carefully. You marry her. Do everything to make her happy and cheerful and joyful. Have a baby. You can get the hell out of here. What baby? Again, I did not understand what you, Morozov, made her. Loudly and clearly said the man. And if I see even once in all this time that she is sad or, God forbid, crying. I strangled you with my own hands. No, I'd rather send you to the penitentiary for statutory rape. You know what they do to bastards like that there. Stephen shook his head. This is a stupid dream. He's gonna wake up. He's not going to marry anyone. And he doesn't know the girl at all. The man continued, you'll live with us, but forget your girls. 24 o'clock a day you'll be by my daughter's side to fulfill all her wishes. That's your main duty now. What are you talking about? Maybe I didn't knock her up at all. Stephen tried to deny it, but the man's strong hand was at his throat. And I'm not joking. The man threatened. Here's your money. It's for flowers and presents. She had surprises every day. Say that you regret that you did not go out with her that only now you realized how much you love her, that you want to marry her. Do you understand me? Stephen stared in surprise at the wad of bills the stranger tossed carelessly on the table. Do you understand? He said uncertainly. When the man left the room, he took a long time to come to his senses. At home, the girls are rich, so they do not live poor. This is, apparently, her father. Who's the other one? Maybe a brother. No, probably a security guard or something. Like a bodyguard. Married. What a mess. The sun ravaged Evelyn's room. She opened her eyes and thought she didn't feel like getting up at all. The girl pulled the curtains and was stunned. And downstairs at the gate stood a familiar bike. And on the path to the house walked Stephen with a bouquet of flowers. It couldn't be. She threw on her robe and went downstairs quickly. Her mother opened the door, and on the threshold Evelyn saw her favorite boyfriend. Hello. He turned to Emily. May I see Evelyn? Come in, the woman invited. And who are you? My name is Stephen. I'm an acquaintance of Evelyn's. And you're her mom? Yes, Emily answered. At that moment the boy saw Evelyn standing at the bottom of the stairs. She looked at him in surprise. Hello, Evelyn. This is for you, Stephen handed the bouquet to the girl. I wanted to see you. Come in, quietly said the girl. They went into the living room. Mom took the bouquet in her hands. I'll put it in a vase. Do you have one? The young man Stephen looked around. He had never seen such luxurious surroundings. Yes, this house certainly does not compare with his village slaughterhouse. Stylish, beautiful furniture, expensive repairs, Floor vases. Good living, he thought. 
Evelyn's father appeared in the room. Not understanding Emily called him after all the guy came to see his daughter. It is not possible without the father. Stephen stood up abruptly from the couch. Hello. Evelyn's father pretended to see him for the first time. I'm Stephen, Evelyn's friend. The girl looked at everything that was happening with an uncomprehending look. A friend then, asked the father. The boy hesitated a little. Well, as a friend, in general, I love your daughter and want to marry her. He said these words in one breath. He didn't expect that from himself. Wow, the father said. Look, mother, we have a groom. Well, let's get acquainted. I'm Christopher, Father Evelyn. And as you've already realized, the man invited the boy to sit down and Evelyn and her mother remained standing. There was silence in the living room. Evelyn's mother decided to break the awkward silence. I'll go make some tea. Do you want tea or coffee? Young man. Coffee, please, answered Stephen. The woman went out. Evelyn. The guide turned to the girl. I just realized now. I've been thinking a lot. I did a really bad thing. Then at the bar, I realized you're the best girl in the world. You're the most beautiful and kind. It took me over a month to realize that. I'm sorry. I really want us to be together. Evelyn looked at him and her eyes shone with happiness. She threw herself around Stephen's neck and hugged him and he kissed her. Evelyn's father decided to intervene in this idol. So, and no one wants to ask me if I'm going to let you guys date with such far-reaching plans. Evelyn ran up to her father. Daddy, honey, I love him very much and he loves me too. You heard him. He loves me too. Now we're going to be together. We'll see, Christopher said thoughtfully and walked away, leaving the boys alone. I thought I would never see you again, Evelyn said. I'm sorry, I was such a fool, answered Stephen. I don't take offense. No, at first I was angry and mad at you, but then I realized that I can't hold grudges for long. And also Stephen, we are going to have a baby. Stephen made a surprised face. It's true. A smile and a faint semblance of joy lingered on his face. Yes, it's going to be our baby, you and I. Ours, you know. Our continuation of love. Evelyn could not believe that her beloved had come to her, confessed his love, and even wanted to marry. She had forbidden herself to even think about it before. And now they will always be together. And soon, they will have a baby boy. Emily set the table in the garden, put a beautiful tea set, inviting the guests to the table. Looking into the living room, she called out to her daughter. When everyone was assembled, Christopher began the conversation so, young people, we don't have much time. Or rather, you have a little. Soon you'll be able to see your belly from the branch. So since we are all gathered here, let's discuss your future. He paused from his cup of flavored coffee. Will you live? We're not even discussing that. We'll play the wedding year. We'll order an off-site registration banquet menu and the guest list we'll take care of with mom. Evelyn, order food and appetizers from the best restaurant and service to be top-notch. Find some musicians and I'll arrange for the registration. It didn't take long. The wedding would be in a month. Evelyn was glowing with happiness. Looking at her, Christopher thought that he would do anything for his daughter, as long as she smiled. He decided not to say anything to his wife. It would be better that way. On the day of Evelyn and Stephen's wedding, the house was abuzz with activity from the very morning. The decorator arrived, waiters, musicians, and people Evelyn didn't know were scurrying about. It seemed that the house had become a big anthill where everyone had something to do. Everyone knew their tasks and carried them out. Vanessa in a beautiful violet-colored dress was arranging Evelyn's hair on her head, distributing the curls. The tiara will look very beautiful, she said. And jewelry in place. Let's get the dress on. I'll close the door so Stephen doesn't come in. It's bad luck to see the bride before the wedding. I don't believe in omens. I believe Stephen. And he says we'll be fine and live happily ever after. Vanessa corrected the dress on her friend, straightened the hem, and started to take the corset. Yes, friend, 
have you started to get better yet? We bought the dress two weeks ago, and it's already tight. I didn't tighten it too much. It's fine. It's fine. She stood at the window and watched Stephen in a beautiful costume of a passing moose through the garden between the sculptures of angels. He must be worried, the bride thought. Mom came into the room. Well, girls, how are you ready here? She scrutinized her daughter. Evelyn looked marvelous. We are ready, but we are hungry, Vanessa complained. Go to the kitchen, you'll find something there, Emily suggested. And you, my daughter, are not hungry. Can I bring you something to eat? Evelyn refused. She didn't want anything. She couldn't wait to have a wedding ring on her finger. And she and Stephen were pronounced husband and wife. Soon, the guests began to arrive. Christopher and Emily met them in the courtyard. Among the guests were her father's partners, well-known businessmen in the city, deputies, and some people from the tax authorities, internal affairs, and many other people unknown to Evelyn. Finally, her father came up to the room. Daughter, we have to go out. Now the registration will begin. Solemn music was playing in the garden. Evelyn walked with her father to the Presidium, where Stephen was already waiting for her. The bride was holding a small bouquet of tea roses. She smiled at the groom. The father passed his daughter's hand to the boyfriend, stepped back and sat down next to Emily. The registration of Evelyn and Stephen's marriage began. They said the words of the vows they had learned beforehand. They exchanged rings and kissed. The guests clapped their hands, waiters ran in, handed out glasses of champagne and light appetizers. The newlyweds stayed among the invited guests for a while and then secluded themselves in the garden. Stephen got a bottle of whiskey from somewhere. Evelyn seemed to be getting drunker and drunker. Maybe you shouldn't drink so much. The girl tried to take the bottle away from him. It's okay. I can drink at my own wedding. Of course you can, but why get so drunk? Evelyn's father, who was passing by, overheard the conversation. Daughter, may I steal your husband for a moment? Of course, Daddy. He took Stephen by the elbow and pushed him in the direction of the house. Listen, you asshole. What are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be entertaining Evelyn, not pouring alcohol into yourself. Christopher gripped Stephen's elbow tightly. Have you forgotten? Tell us. I haven't forgotten anything. The guy tried to justify himself behind his flying tongue. I just want a drink and ideas. And make sure that Evelyn does not have a single reason to be upset. Stephen wandered over to his young wife. They'd been living together for a month. If his father was to be believed, after the birth he should let Stephen go, and he would be able to live a free life again, to have fun and go out. Stephen has an unbearable urge to go to the club. That's where the fun is. And here it's not a wedding, but a gathering of some down-and-out bigwigs. But the rich man didn't spare any money for his daughter's wedding. He didn't want to fall in the mud in front of his partners. Eh, if they saw Stephen's relatives now, they'd all go crazy with luxury. How Stephen lived this month, they couldn't even dream of. Plenty of food. The house is beautiful and rich. The clothes he bought with his daddy's money. Let them pay for his, Stephen's, inconvenience. As if he had always dreamed of living with his daughter, who was also pregnant. When the entourage asked Stephen which of the guests would be coming from his side, the boy was confused at first. But the father immediately found something to say. Let's not invite them. It's a long drive. Parents are not old people. Why burden them? I'll send them presents, and then we'll invite them to visit. My daughter didn't argue. After all, she doesn't even know these people. Now she was only thinking about the fact that Stephen would soon marry her, and then their baby would be born. The subject of the groom's parents never came up again in the house. Stephen padded out to his and Evelyn's bedroom and collapsed on the bed. He slept until morning without taking off his suit and shoes. Stephen awoke to the aroma of coffee. Evelyn entered the room carrying a tray with two coffee cups on it. Wake up, I made us some coffee, she said, smiling. The boy's head was buzzing like an alarmed hive of wild bees. He struggled to get out of bed and took the cup his young wife held out to him. 
Thank you. You'd better give me a pill for my head. I've already taken care of you. There's a pill and a glass of water on the nightstand. I didn't realize you could get so drunk. I didn't realize what I was doing. I'm sorry, I must have been overexcited. Whether you just said it or just Stephen. I have to go to the women's health clinic today, Evelyn said. You're coming with me. As it turned out, Stephen had to not only give flowers and gifts to his wife, but also go with her to doctor's appointments. His father had explained that to him too. Of course I'll go, he said. I'll just take a shower and then we'll go. Great. Evelyn smiled. Then she went to get ready. Evelyn's pregnancy was going well. And there were no complications. She had already stopped throwing up. And that made Evelyn very happy. After the doctor, she wanted to go to the baby supply store. I really want to start buying everything for the baby, she told her husband. Too bad. It's considered bad luck. Oh, come on. It's no big deal. Come on, let's go through some stuff. I wish we knew whether it's a boy or a girl. Which one do you want more? Evelyn stopped and looked into Stephen's eyes. I don't care, he said. But he corrected himself. I mean, I care. I'd be happy with a son or a daughter. But a son is better. Why is that? Well, fathers have a better relationship with their sons. They can go fishing together. And you can teach your son how to ride a bike. Stephen laughed for some reason. That's a stereotype. My dad and I have a great relationship, and he taught me how to ride a bike. I never went fishing with him, though. They came home with bags full of stuff for the baby. Mommy, look what we bought, shouted Evelyn from the doorstep. Stephen threw the bags on the sofa in the living room and collapsed with his legs stretched out. Emily and Sveta began to sort through the purchases. What overshoes? They are only interested in clothes, the boy thought. Soon his studies at his technical school would begin, and he would be able to leave this house for a while and not see his wife. How much he was fed up with her instructions. Sweet, sweet kitty, bunny. I'm sick to death of it. The labor began in the night. Evelyn suddenly screamed, and Stephen woke up. What? What happened? He mumbled. It seemed to have begun. The girl cried out in pain. Hurry up and call mom and dad. Father and mother ran into the room. Hush, daughter. It's all right. Emily said, Father, why are you standing there? Let's get the car out of the garage. Christopher ran down the stairs. Mom, why does it hurt so much? It's normal, honey. It'll be over soon and everything will be fine. Emily reassured her daughter. Come on. Get up slowly and let's go downstairs. We're going to the hospital. Stephen, take a bag of things for the hospital from the closet. The confused Stephen rushed to the closet, grabbed the bag and followed his wife and mother-in-law. At the hospital, Evelyn was placed on a gurney and wheeled down a long hallway. The nurse on duty softly addressed the relatives you go home. First labor, it won't be quick. When it's over, she'll call you. Christopher went over to her. He took a bill out of his jacket pocket, slipped it into the woman's hand. Please call me as soon as you know everything, how she gave birth, who was born. He asked the nurse and held out a business card. Of course, she said, don't worry, I will definitely call you. That night there was a commotion in the maternity hospital. They brought in a woman who had gone into labor right outside. She had no papers on her. The woman gave birth to a baby girl and died. The doctors couldn't save the mother's life. And then they brought in a young girl. She screamed with pain and even cried. On examination, it turned out that the uterus did not open and the child was lying across. It was necessary to urgently make a caesarean section, but the anesthesiologist on duty was busy in another department. At the operation, the girl was given an anesthetic injection. They started to prepare for surgery and waited for the anesthesiologist to be available because of complications with the surgery. In the other department, he was delayed so much, time was lost. Evelyn's daughter was stillborn. In the emergency room, the nurse on duty sat and thought. She did not dare to call the girl's father and tell him that the baby had died, but she had to do it because she had promised him 
and he had paid her well. She dialed the number on the card. Hello, Christopher. It's the nurse from the delivery room. Where are you going? Emily asked her husband, who was suddenly going somewhere. I have an urgent business to attend to, he answered, hiding his eyes. What urgent business? Our daughter is giving birth. The woman was indignant. By the way, did you call from the hospital? No, they didn't. I'll be right back. Christopher closed the door behind him, not understanding anything. Emily watched out the window as he drove out of the gate and sped away. Evelyn's father waited for the doctor in the emergency room. Finally, he was invited in and told where the office of the head of the maternity ward was. Hello, how did this happen? Why didn't you save the baby? He asked a woman with glasses who was sitting behind a desk in the office. Sit down, please, she said calmly. It's a force majeure. Your daughter had a transverse fetal movement. The uterus wouldn't open. We had to operate. Unfortunately, the baby didn't survive. Her heart couldn't take it. I'm so sorry. Christopher lowered his head. He wondered what would happen to his daughter when she found out about the trouble. Stephen would be gone too. The man had prepared for that. He realized that the girl would be upset, but her child would be there, and caring for him should help her recover from her husband's departure. But what about now? More than anything else in his life, he wanted his daughter to be happy. The door to the study opened quietly. Anna Egorovna signed the documents for, quietly asked a young nurse, come back later. The woman replied. The meaning of the word suddenly came to Christopher. Not bodies, but bodies. What's wrong with my daughter? He shrieked, jumping out of his chair. Is she dead? The doctor quickly got up and waved his hands calm down. She's fine. She is now in the intensive care unit, will soon come to her senses. Anna Yegorovna handed him a glass of water. Here drink, calm down. It's another woman in labor died. A woman was picked up from the street by kind people and brought right to the bus stop. She went into labor. What was she sick for? Asked the man from the water. No, not sick, just weak. Now we will never know what happened to her, how her life punished her but I feel sorry for the girl. Three kicks, nine points. Dad, what little girl? Evelyn's father asked. Like the girl her daughter gave birth to and died. Couldn't save her. Christopher grabbed the superintendent's hands, began to shake, begging please give this girl to us as if she were my daughter. We'll raise her. She won't need anything. What are you talking about? The doctor tried to wrestle her palms from his hands. It's illegal. I'll pay. How much do you want? Any amount. Just register the baby as ours. I'm begging you. If you don't, my daughter will go crazy. The doctor sat down on the chair. She's thinking. She hadn't signed the body papers yet. In principle, it could be done in a way that wouldn't hurt a mosquito. But what about the staff? Everyone on shift that night saw the man's daughter's baby die. The midwife, the anesthesiologist, the nurse. She took a small piece of paper, wrote four sums on it, showed it to Christopher. The man did not hesitate for a moment, said he would bring the money soon, and quickly left the office. He drove home gloomier than a cloud. He was not completely sure whether he had done the right thing in buying it. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he had bought for his daughter a living child, a girl who had been born to some woman from the street. If you think about the meaning of what he did, it's scary. But he won't say anything to anyone. No one will know anything. Everything will be fine. After all, what future awaits this child? An orphanage, poverty, no loved ones. And they'll love her as if she were their own. Didn't they call from the maternity hospital? Asked her husband Emily, when he appeared on the threshold of the house. They did, he replied. Our Evelyn gave birth to a baby girl. Oh, what a joy! Emily exclaimed. What time? What's the weight, height? I don't know. But how could you? You didn't even ask. I'm sorry I got confused. And I was driving. Christopher excused himself. I'll call the hospital right away, his wife hurried. No, don't, he stopped her. 
Let's go there a little later. We'll find out for ourselves. Emily looked at her husband in surprise. He seemed strange. Mom and Dad and Stephen came to meet Evelyn at the hospital. They were waiting in the discharge room for the young mom to come in and bring the baby girl. Christopher placed a package on the table. It contained a bottle of good champagne candy. Stephen held flowers in his hands. Here is our girl, said the nurse who entered the room. Well, relatives, check if everything is in place. There are five toes on her feet and five toes on her hands. The baby lay quietly on the nurse's singing table and looked at the people bent over her. The nurse began to dress her. Evelyn entered the room. She wanted to look very pretty, so she lingered in the room, coloring her eyes and lips and styling her hair. Daughter. Parents rushed to hug the girl. How are you feeling? I'm fine. Evelyn nodded and walked over to Stephen, hugged him. Now you and I have a daughter. Look, I think she looks just like you. Stephen didn't. She doesn't look like anybody. And how can a child who's only a few years old bear any resemblance to her parents? In honor of the arrival of a new member of the family for dinner was set a festive table. The little girl slept peacefully in a crib in Evelyn and Stephen's bedroom. What shall we call our granddaughter? Mom asked Evelyn. Yes and really, Stephen. What do you think? Stephen was silent. It was as if he could not hear the conversation at the table. All he could think about was that now he would be able to leave this house and go back to his merry, rambunctious life. The girls from the nightclub, his friends, he could ride his bike around town whenever he wanted. Stephen, why don't you say something? Evelyn looked at her husband carefully. Why, the guy did not understand her question. I said, how are we going to name our daughter? But we decided. I don't understand anything about women's names. Let's call her car. Emily suggested it. Oh no, what's a car? Objected Evelyn. It's not a fashionable name at all. I want to call her Camille. How does that sound? It's a good name, Christopher agreed. After dinner, Evelyn's father retired to the study. After waiting for a while, Stephen knocked on the door. I want to talk to you. Come out. I have fulfilled your condition now I can be free. Evelyn had the baby, everything was fine. And all these months she's been happy, just like you wanted. Christopher went to the window. Stephen spoke about something that had been bothering him for a long time. The daughter has to breastfeed the baby. What if she loses her milk? What if she becomes depressed like when Stephen didn't want to go out with her? Thoughts of what to do after the birth when Stephen wanted to leave worried Christopher. But he kept chasing them away. I have a proposition for you. You'll stay with us and live with my daughter for another year. But no way. He's got his eyes out for his father-in-law. Look, I'll pay you well. You can even buy yourself a small apartment. Think about it. It's not like you're ever going to buy your own place in the city working in a bar. Stephen thought about it for a while, then made up his mind. Okay, a year is a year, but I'll go back to work at the nightclub. I'd rather be behind the bar than listen to a baby crying all night. Christopher had to agree when Stephen announced to Evelyn that he was going back to work. She was surprised. Why would you do that? We have plenty of everything. And even if you do want to work and earn money, let me talk to Dad, and he'll get you a job at his trading firm. No, I'll work in a bar, her husband objected, noticing that the girl was upset. He quickly corrected himself. It's all for you and the girl. I'll be helping you during the day so you can rest more. Evelyn smiled. How thoughtful you are. All right, work at your club, but we'll be together during the day. But very soon she realized that her ideas of happy parents, walking together with their daughter, playing with her and spending all their time together, were a mirage. Stephen came in the morning, often smelling of alcohol. He would sleep most of the day and then leave in the evening. One night, the daughter had a high fever. Evelyn did not know what to do. We should call an ambulance. The mother said, no, we don't. We'll take her ourselves. It'll be quicker that way. The father fussed. After dressing the girl, they got into the car and drove to the hospital. It was raining heavily outside, 
and lightning flashes lit up the night sky from time to time. Christopher was driving at high speed. Suddenly, he was blinded by the headlights of an oncoming truck. There was no way to avoid the collision between the SUV and the truck. Stephen arrived at the scene of the accident in the morning. He was not burning with love for the family, but when he saw his father-in-law's car and three black bags, which apparently contained the corpses of the father, mother, and their daughter, he was confused and felt a lump come up to his throat. The investigator approached the guy and asked, are you the son-in-law? Yes? Tell me, is it them? Stephen looked at the black bags on the roadside. Yeah. Unfortunately, they're all dead. They didn't stand a chance. Head-on collision. And the speed, judging by the braking distance, was very high. I need to ask you a few questions. It's a formality. I'm sorry, are you able to answer? Yeah, the kid answered. Camille was walking back from school through the square. She walked slowly, kicking the fallen leaves with the toe of her shoe. The girl didn't feel like going home at all. There was a drunken father, empty bottles, and hardly any food. She hardly ever saw him sober, but the worst was when he brought home drinking buddies. They'd yell all over the kitchen, swear, and sometimes fight. The neighbors would curse, bang on the radiator. Tonight, Camille, we didn't sleep well because of my father's guests, who had an all-night party. Camille, you could hear your father's voice from the room when she opened the front door. Stephen stepped out into the hallway, leaning against the door jam. Let's cook something. Something to eat. I'm hungry. Camille walked silently past him, shut herself in her room. She dreamed of graduating from high school, enrolling in a school, and leaving home, preferably a place to study away from her father. Now she would rest a little and go to the cafe, which was located in the neighboring house. There Camille worked part-time as a dishwasher, a kind neighbor aunt, knowing that they sometimes have a few days of food in the house is not in the house, put there. There the girl sometimes managed to eat something, and if she was lucky, her father too. She brought dried cutlets from behind the window, sandwiches. Camille didn't have a mom, or rather, the girl didn't know her. Her father said she died in a car accident with her parents. If her mom had been with her, if she had raised her instead of her father, things would have been different. How often did Camille think that? Sixteen years ago, Stephen's life changed abruptly. That day is questioned and investigator. After the accident that killed his father-in-law, mother-in-law, and Evelyn, the guy didn't immediately remember that his daughter's little girl was also supposed to be in a car. She was taken away in an ambulance. The investigator replied to his question about the baby. So she is alive. Stephen asked uncertainly. Yes. Surprisingly, the baby survived. I think thanks to the fact that she was strapped in a baby car cradle. She's in the hospital now, but you can go there and pick up your daughter if the doctors allow it. Pick her up where? Why? What will he do with her? Stephen returned to the house where he had said goodbye to his unloved wife the night before and left for his shift at the nightclub. He couldn't have imagined then that the house would be completely empty in the morning. Yes, he didn't love Evelyn, but in the year he'd lived with her, the girl had become something close to him. What about the baby? Probably, the daughter will be given to an orphanage. Stephen poured whiskey into a glass. The silence was broken by the trill of the telephone. The guy picked up the phone. I'm listening. Hello, a woman's voice on the other end of the line. Hello, it's the hospital. Who am I talking to? I'm here about the girl who was brought to us today from the accident site. Her father Stephen said these words and was surprised at how clearly they sounded. We examined the girl. She was not injured in the accident, but the child has bilateral pneumonia, so you can't take her home yet. We'll treat her, and then we'll take her home. Yes. Can you bring the baby's things, feeding bottle, and diapers? Yes, I will. When are we waiting? Have a good day. The phone rang. Stephen drank from a glass and went to pack the girl's things to take to the hospital. On the shelves, everything was folded in perfect order jackets, t-shirts, suits, 
onesies. Not paying attention to what things he was putting in his bag, he gathered everything on the shelf. He'd take it back tomorrow morning. He couldn't bear to get drunk, but he didn't want to drink alone. Stephen dialed the number of Wendy, with whom he had been partying all night at the club. Lisa, come and see me. I'm so thirsty, but there's no one to talk to. Kodak answered with a cheerful voice in the phone. Stephen said the address, and an hour later bright, carefree Wendy was already standing on the doorstep. She was wearing a tight dress with a deep neckline. Her precise figure beckoned. Would you like a drink? He asked the girl. But poor. He plumped down on a soft armchair and put his leg over the leg. Tell me, what happened to your wife? Did you have a fight with your wife or your father-in-law offends you? They are no more, Stephen said, holding out a glass to his friend. What do you mean gone? Did you kill them and bury them? You've got to be kidding me. She laughed, finding her joke very successful. They were in an accident tonight. All three of them died. The girl stopped laughing. How awful, she said quietly. Stephen understood that he had to attend to the funeral, but he understood nothing at all about the process, and there was no one else to bury his wife and her parents. And you call the secretary, Evelyn, the father. Usually rich people have secretaries or personal assistants to take care of everything, Wendy suggested. Right. Why didn't he think of that? Christopher's secretary already knew what had happened. I called and informed John Ward, Christopher's right-hand man. She suddenly went quiet. She didn't say much. X-arm, it turns out. He promised to arrange the funeral. Stephen breathed a sigh of relief, filled his glass with whiskey again, and poured Wendy a refill. Listen, so you're going to live here now? She asked admiringly. It's a nice place. A house like this. Like a palace, like a palace, like a palace. I don't know. Stephen answered indifferently. What do you mean you don't know? Where are you bringing your daughter? To the dormitory of your technical school, or what? And she is the heiress of all this, and it is rightfully her home. And you're her father, so you should live here. Stephen never thought of that. It's true. Camille is heir to everything that belongs to the family but he's also the heir to his wife, Evelyn. So, what he's going to enjoy his father-in-law's fortune legally and not have to live in a dorm with cockroaches. Stephen's already imagining trading in his bike for a cool car, marrying a cool girl, even Wendy. What about her? Skater, she's fun. You can sit in a club with her, you can sit in bed with her. She's a total class act. And the kid can get a babysitter. Stephen's imagination painted a rosy picture of the future. Wendy, will you marry me? The girl laughed, plumped on his lap, and wrapped her arms around his neck. Why not? Stretching the words slightly, she said, You are now an enviable groom at our place. After the funeral, Ward's late father-in-law's right-hand man took the boy aside. We need to talk about the inheritance, the business, and a few things. Is it convenient for you to come to the office, or should I come to you with the documents myself? I'll come, Stephen said. Stephen had never been to Evelyn's father's farm. The secretary ushered him into the office, which was furnished with expensive furniture. So this is where Christopher ran his business from. This is where he made his money. A couple minutes later, Ward entered the office. He was holding a red folder. Well, once again, my condolences on the death of the family. He spoke in a calm voice, but formalities in business cannot be delayed. Ward opened the folder and looked up at Stephen. Do you have any questions? No. Then I'll get started. Christopher left some orders that pertain to his estate. I guess he didn't intend to die, but he made the basics official. All real estate and assets of Herm's trading company passed to his wife and daughter in the event of Christopher's death. But in our case, there are none. Then legally the sole heir is Camille, your daughter. And I wondered, boy, can I inherit my wife's share? The wife Christopher and his daughter Evelyn had no further allocation. In fact, they own nothing. So you have nothing to inherit. But since you are the father of the only and minor heiress, which cannot enter into the rights of inheritance due to age, 
until her majority can dispose of the property, that is, the house of the car as well as the profits of the company. Do you understand? Stephen seemed very clear. He will live in the house, his father-in-law's car will also go to him. He would get the money from the firm's account. He was fine with that. Who will manage my late father-in-law's affairs? He asked him. The firm belonged to Christopher, it was true. But the authorized capital was divided between him and me and another co-founder. So now the affairs of the firm will be managed by me and him. If you don't trust us, you can have us audited. No, I trust you completely. Stephen didn't understand anything about his late father-in-law's business and didn't want to burden himself with unnecessary worries. He was content to spend the profits as he saw fit. I don't pretend to run it. I understand. Let me digress and lead you now. Business. The man rose and left. Stephen followed him. On the way, he dialed Wendy's cell phone. Come, you know the address. Anything to celebrate. Soon a cab stopped in front of the house and Wendy jumped out of it. High heels on the path, she hurried towards the house. What, is there any good news? She asked Stephen. Well, whether it's good or not, I don't know yet. In general, listen, all the profits from the firm of my late father-in-law, my ears are now at my disposal. And a car at home. Wow, that's really good news. But I guess there's bad news. I'm supposed to be the baby's father. Well, you are the father. So the girl didn't get it. I'm supposed to be a real father, raise her, live with her, all that stuff. I don't know, daycare, school, rides. What else do kids need? Well, your little girl's just a baby. All she needs is a meal, a diaper change, a walk with the stroller. Wendy didn't have any parenting experience either. It was not difficult for them to hire a nanny for the girl. On the appointed day, she came to the house. Wendy showed the woman the girl's room, the kitchen, and the living room. It was decided that she would live with them. She was a foreigner. It was even better, for the nanny would be near the child all the time, and she and Stephen could go about their business and enjoy life. When Camille recovered, Wendy and Stephen went to pick her up from the hospital. The new parents paid almost no attention to the girl at all. She was with the nanny all the time. In the evening, they would leave to go clubbing. In the daytime, they would rashly drive around the city looking for fun places, restaurants with delicious food, and without hesitation, spend money. Technical school, Stephen dropped out. Why study when you have several retail establishments working for you at once? Sometimes, he had to go grocery shopping. He bought according to the list prepared for him by the housekeeper. Wendy absolutely refused to stand at the stove, and they hardly ever ate at home. The groceries were mostly bought for baby food. Growing up, Camille. Stephen. The girl's nanny approached him one day. Would you please allow me to leave at 200 hours? I need to go to the drugstore very urgently. Stephen was enjoying himself on the sofa in the living room. The woman's request had taken him by surprise. He didn't want to sit with Camille for even 15 minutes, and it was 2 o'clock. And Wendy, as it happened, was out shopping again. I'll try to be back very soon. The nanny looked at him, I beg you, with her eyes. Go. Stephen had no choice but to let the woman go. Just feed the baby. Now dress it. Yes, of course I will. Thank you very much. After all, Camille is no longer a baby. She just turned three. To play in the garden. Stephen took Camille out into the yard standing. He told his daughter, I'll go and get some toys. The girl remained obediently standing in the yard. When Stephen came out of the house, he saw a terrible picture of the girl lying on the grass, and she was dragged like a doll across the lawn by a huge dog. Stephen rushed to his daughter. Uh, get out. He shouted hitting the dog on the back with a child's trowel. He lifted the little girl into his arms. She didn't even cry. At first, Stephen thought she was dead, but the girl moaned softly and apparently fainted from fright. Her face was covered with blood. There was a gaping laceration on her cheek. Stephen carried the girl into the house, put her on the couch, began to rush around the room looking for the phone. 
Soon the child was bitten by a dog. She's covered in blood. What's a three-year-old child? Please hurry. The ambulance took Stephen and the baby to the hospital. The girl was quickly taken somewhere on a gurney. Stephen was left waiting in the emergency room. Where did that damn dog come from? How could this happen to the girl? She's just a little girl. Of course, she couldn't have handled it. She couldn't run away from the dog. And she doesn't understand anything yet. He was tormented by guilt. But why? Why had he left the child alone in the yard? Probably because he knew it was safe for the baby behind the high fence. But how could the dog have gotten into the territory? And that's when Stephen realized it was probably the babysitter. When she left, she didn't see the dog run into the yard. But he's gonna give her a good one. The girl was operated on and stitched up, but they wouldn't let her out of the hospital. She needed it. Medics and dressings. Stephen was advised to go home, so he called a cab. When he returned, he found the nanny at home, first yelled at her and chased her away without pay for the days already worked this month. When the woman left, he started to dial the beast, but she entered the house herself with her arms full of packages from the stores. This event greatly shook Stephen. Practically before his eyes in his own home, a stranger's dog had nearly chewed his daughter to death. Stephen, it's going to be all right. The doctors will take care of it. Don't worry about it. Wendy, don't you understand? She's my daughter. She's small, thin, defenseless. I can't imagine what it must have felt like to be dragged across the lawn by a monster like that. Two weeks later, the girl was released from the hospital. She had a huge scar on her cheek. It made the little girl's face look a little twisted. Stephen looked at his main daughter with horror. Suddenly, he had a strong desire to hug her, to hold her close to him. He stroked her hair, saying everything will be all right. A new nanny had been found for Camille. Stephen hadn't been to a nightclub for a month, which Wendy didn't like. That we're always at home. I'm sick of it. Let's go out. The end. Look, if you want to go, you can go. Okay. I want to be home. Let's go. She sat on his lap, kissed him. Stephen thought it might be a good idea to go. Who'd be the worse for wear? In a month, there had been changes at the warden. One of the interior rooms was renovated and turned into a casino. That's cool. I've only seen casinos like that in movies. Stephen looked around in admiration. I told you, let's go to the club. And you refused. Let's try our luck. Stephen's eyes glistened in anticipation of gambling and winning. He did get lucky at first. A mountain of chips was already lying in front of him, and a satisfied Wendy was laughing merrily, willy-nilly. One by one, the glasses of champagne came down. The excitement took Stephen completely. I bet everything loudly, he said. Strangers standing around the table supported him approvingly. But this time, luck apparently did not leave the room for long. Stephen lost all the chips he had won earlier. Shit, the guy cursed. I've been lucky all this time. He took a glass of cognac from under the nose of a passing waiter and drank it in one gulp. Stephen and Wendy spent the rest of the night at the club. At home, they found themselves at dawn drunk and rattled off to sleep. Stephen started frequenting the casino. The game was so addictive that he couldn't deny himself the pleasure of going to play. One morning, he was awakened by the loud trill of the telephone. Fumbling for the receiver on the bed, he struggled to answer. Who is it? Stephen, hello, it's Ward. I've got something to talk to you about. You can come to the office. What's up? Why? Stephen didn't understand. Just come by. I'll be expecting you today. After a shower, a cup of coffee, Stephen drove to the firm's office. Ward was sitting in the office. The secretary invited the guy in, and he entered. Have a seat, Libkin invited. He wrote something on a piece of paper, finished it, put it aside. Checking the accounts showed that you spend huge sums of money and spend it not on the upbringing of a girl legitimate heir to her father's fortune and lose in the casino. This is unacceptable. It's none of your business, snapped Stephen. You're wrong. It is my business. I could support the girl myself, or I could give you a limited amount of money 
and invest the profits in the development of the business. By the time Camille came of age, I could provide her with a steady income for the rest of her life. I don't understand what you want me to do. I want you to stop living a bad life, get a job and raise your daughter properly. Otherwise, I will be forced to deal with this matter drastically. Fuck you. Stephen stood up abruptly and headed for the door. The young man said to Ward after him, I advise you to take my words seriously. Stephen walked out without looking back, slamming the door loudly. Freak, he said softly in the waiting room. A month later, Stephen had no money to pay for a babysitting pen. He sold his late father-in-law's car, which stood idly in the garage. Stephen himself never got his driver's license, putting it off until later. He was satisfied with a bike or a cab. After collecting all the cash he had, he went to the club. He's gonna get lucky tonight. He knows it, he will win a lot of money, and until the next dividends from the company he will live peacefully. But luck turned against him this time. Stephen lost every penny. Staggering from the alcohol he drank, he went to the exit. Caught a cab. The driver had to wait a long time for a passenger to bring him money from the house. He didn't have a ruble in his pockets. He slept through lunch. He was all wrinkled, unshaven and smelling of booze, and went into the kitchen. Nanny was feeding Camille. Stephen. She turned to the girl's father. You must have forgotten. Yesterday was the first of the month. You promised to pay me for last month. Stephen looked thoughtfully out of the window. The snow was falling quietly. Where is Wendy? He asked the nanny. She's gone somewhere. Said she'd be back tonight. So I'll decide about the money today, Stephen said, and left the kitchen. That afternoon he shook out the box of things, threw all the stuff in the pantry. There was his mother-in-law's jewelry from the branch to the wedding ring, and the gemstone tiara his father had given his daughter for her wedding. Where did they go? Finally the jewelry was found the guy rode them into a box. The pawn shop gave much less for the jewelry than it was worth. But Stephen needed the money. In the evening he waited for Wendy. When the girl came back, he told her they had no more money. You've lost it all again, Wendy resented him. What are we gonna live on now? This wasn't our deal. I know. But it's Ward's fault. Stephen justified himself. He's the one who's cutting off my oxygen. He wants to leave my daughter without an inheritance. I don't care. You better think about how we're gonna live. Look at the cracks and branches on things. Maybe we can sell something. We could. Enough for the first time. Then I'll figure something out. That month we sold fur coats, evening gowns, some other things. They were followed by Chinese paintings, China. And then Stephen started selling off appliances, never giving up hope of winning money. He took everything he made to the casino. Sometimes he won, but not much. Mostly he went home with empty pockets, looking at the slender guy, the croupier quietly, so that others could not hear, said need money. I can help you. He signaled Stephen to follow him. In a small room at a table sat a man about 45 years old croupier. He said something softly to him and walked out. So you're thinking of getting even. You want the money. Yeah, I'm gonna get lucky. I'll win and I can pay it back. Can you help me? I did. Why not help a regular customer? The man opened the desk drawer and took out several wads of bills. Look, when you win, don't forget to pay me back. Sure, I'll pay you back. Stephen scooped up the money and hastily plowed through his pockets. That night he'd lost everything he'd borrowed from the casino owner. Security threw him out the door like a dog. And in the morning, three cops broke in. They beat him badly, told him to bring the money back in three days at the latest. They hired them. The girl, seeing all this, was scared out of her wits. Would you excuse me, Stephen? She said, handing him a napkin to wipe the blood on his broken lip. But I don't want to stay in a house that could be broken into by bandits at any moment. I'm leaving. Stephen started to call Wendy, but her phone was out of range. What a bastard, he cursed, always out when he needed to be. Little Camille looked out of the room. The girl quietly walked down the stairs and sat on the living room floor. She must have needed something to feed her. 
Stephen began to open the kitchen cupboard doors one by one. There was almost nothing in them. Some cereals, salt, sugar, more pasta. There was some sausage and a few eggs in the refrigerator. Camille, do you want some sausage? The father asked his daughter. She nodded. He cut off a piece of sausage and handed it to the little girl. He had to find a way to get some money. A cab pulled up in front of the house and Wendy arrived. Where are you? Stephen asked. Yeah, I slept over at a friend's house. We talked late. She's from out of town. From a resort, Wendy bequeathed. Stephen, let's go somewhere else. See, son, five-star hotel. Yeah, you wish. Where would I get the money? Wendy noticed the guy's broken face. Who did that to you? She asked fearfully. Have you been beaten up? Where have you been? Now you don't have to go anywhere to get a face like that. Stephen retorted angrily. It's a house call. He told Wendy all about the money he had borrowed from the casino owner. She listened in silence and then grabbed her head shit. What are we going to do? How are you going to pay it back? That's a lot of money. I don't know. The only thing we can do is sell the house. Stephen, there's no other way. We'll have to go through someone we know. They won't give us much because of the urgency, but maybe we can get a two-bedroom in the suburbs. Are you crazy? Do you have any other options? Or do you want to lie in the woods digging in the snow? They're really gonna kill you. Yeah, you're probably right. There's no way out. I'm gonna go to the warden tonight, see if I can talk to the landlord. Listen, I need something to feed the mink. It's hungry. It's already eaten the sausage. Wendy got some cookies out of her bag, handed the girl some food, but at least it was a snack. The kid. The debt was settled. And I didn't even have to sell anything. Stephen simply redid the title deeds and moved into a barracks on the outskirts of town, which the club owner gave him in return. The club with a casino, bar and dance floor was not the only business for Robert in this city. He created his empire from scratch, first opened the small cafe on the waterfront, gradually developed a whole network of restaurants. In parallel with the business, Robert was engaged in charity work. He helped kindergartens, schools, orphanages, believing that he who can give something to those who are now difficult must do it. Robert had no family of his own. His mother died a few years ago. She was an authoritative and strong woman who always knew what to do. She cared deeply for her son. She always knew how to insist on her opinion. And it must be said, most of the time Robert agreed with her. The only time they didn't agree was once. Robert and his friends were celebrating his 40th birthday at a restaurant. There was a lot of noise, a lot of fun, a lot of eating, a lot of drinking. Everyone wanted to congratulate such a successful man. Some came and some went in the room at a table by the window. Robert noticed a girl, modestly dressed, but something attracted his eye to her. Some kind of breed or something. That's what they usually say when a girl knows how to hold her own. Robert gestured to the waiter. What's your favorite dessert? Tiramisu, I guess, especially girls like it very much, answered the quick waiter. Bring fruit, desserts, and a glass of champagne. At that table over there. You got it. Will do. The waiter went to fulfill the order. When he put everything on the table, the girl looked around in surprise. There were no familiar faces around. I didn't order this. Did you make a mistake? No, this is from the man for you. Looking in that direction, Nancy saw a stately man in the company. They were clearly celebrating something. The man smiled at her. Later he came over to introduce himself, asked if he could sit down not in the rules. Nancy meets in restaurants, but somehow this man didn't seem threatened or disliked. It's my birthday today. Congratulations, I guess your friends are waiting. The girl asked. It's not nice to leave guests behind. They'll have a good time without me. I'd like to run away somewhere less noisy. I suggest we run away together. Nancy hesitated for a moment, then decided to accept the man's offer. They walked along the promenade, talking about something, as if they had known each other for a long time. Nancy was easy and fun with Robert. 
She didn't immediately notice that they were constantly followed by a black car with tinted windows. That's my security, don't worry, the man explained. Not without it, unfortunately. Those are the rules. If we run away from them, the whole town will be on alert. Are you a bandit? The girl asked. Why would I be a bandit? I'm just building and developing my business. I want and know how to make money. Nancy had a strange feeling. She is a student of philology. He's a grown man with experience. And there is no barrier to communication. She felt very comfortable and at ease. When Nancy found out she was pregnant, she didn't know how to tell Robert, but she already loved him. True, he hadn't confessed his love to her. The next weekend, he invited her out of town to a boarding house. He said there was a lake with swans. She would definitely make up her mind, tell him that she would have a child, and be what it would be. She was thoughtfully pulling picnic food out of the basket. Are you looking a little sad today, or is it just me? Robert asked, putting his arm around her shoulders and looking into her eyes. It wasn't. I'm pregnant. The girl whispered faintly. The man continued to look at her, remained silent, and then pressed her tightly against him. You have no idea how happy I am. You gave me a child, a son or a daughter. This child will definitely be like you, just as beautiful, just as kind. So you don't want me to have an abortion. Don't even think about it. I love you so much. They had a wonderful weekend. Nancy was happy. When they arrived home, the man told his mother, 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 I've met a girl and I'm going to marry her. She's the best in the world. I feel like a boy in love. The woman sat down next to me. I'm so happy for you. Tell me, who is she? What family is she from? How old is she? But why do you care? The main thing is that I love her. And yet her mother insisted, I want to know everything about her. She's a student. She's 20 years old. She has no parents. They died a long time ago. Who raised her? The orphanage. Mom. Robert said firmly. But what does it matter? It matters a lot. You have no idea how many problems there are with this orphanage, with this brat, with these orphans. They're ill-mannered, and they often become delinquents and criminals. Mom, I don't want to hear it. What kind of nonsense is this? Next weekend, wait for us. I'll introduce you by lunch, the most beautiful girl in the world. When Robert and Nancy arrived on the doorstep, the mother could barely contain herself from showing her displeasure at her son's choice. Meet my mom, Jenna. And this is Nancy. Nice to meet you, Rabena, the girl said, smiling. Come on in. The woman looked her over from head to toe. Her gaze was prickly, unfriendly, though she tried to hide it. A table with a snow-white tablecloth was set in the living room. Beautiful dishes and wine glasses were arranged. Robert poured a dry red wine into each glass. Baby, try this salad. This salad is delicious. The man's mother tried to fill the awkward pause. Thank you. Piatinko said you're studying at the institute. And what will you be? I want to work as a teacher of Russian language and literature. I love children. Yes, a teacher. Well, it's a noble profession, but it doesn't pay much. Mom, come on. I'll make money for everything. I'll have enough money and to live decently and to raise my children. Are you thinking of having children already? Paula. Mother asked jokingly. Robert and Nancy looked at each other. The girl stopped chewing and lowered her eyes. Nancy is our mom, and there will be a baby. A sepulchral pause hung over the beautifully set table. Then the woman rose and walked out of the living room. Don't worry about it. She was just taken aback. Such unexpected news. Robert tried to calm Nancy down. Next weekend, I'll move you here. We'll live together. Start packing. I don't have much to pack, she smiled. Nancy's relationship with Robert's mother was complicated. The woman made no secret of her displeasure with her son's choice. She pointed out at every opportunity that Nancy was not brought up properly, that because of her she could not invite respectable people to the house, that she was a beggar. Nancy was a pauper and lived with Robert only for money. 
The girl tried to spend as little time as possible in front of her mother-in-law. The pregnancy was going normally. At the last ultrasound, they said that she and Robert would have a girl. They were both overjoyed. She will be as beautiful as you said, Robert, stroking her tummy. But then you will definitely have to give me a son too, so that he will be the successor of my business. I want at least three children, Nancy replied. When there are many children in a family, joy, noise, constant fun, some kind of trouble that becomes the meaning of life, and I don't mind. He was silent for a little while, and then he said tomorrow, I must go to the capital. A very good deal seems to be piling up, but how will I stay here alone? And what if I go into labor? You're not alone, you're with my mom. Yeah, she's not an easy person, but she's not gonna leave you in a situation like this. She'll help you. But I think it's gonna be okay. I'll be back in time for the birth, and I'll take you to the hospital myself. Robert kissed her, told her not to be afraid of anything. I'll be calling you so often I'll still have time to bore you, he laughed. In the morning, Nancy walked Robert to the door to say goodbye. She hated to let him go. She had a bad feeling about him. The girl went into the kitchen to pour tea. Suddenly, she felt dizzy. Nancy's staggered footsteps hit a porcelain statue. It fell to the floor and shattered. Robert's mother rushed into the room at the noise. Oh my God, she screamed. What have you done? Crooked, wretch. This statue was brought to me from Japan by my late husband, the father of the song. You've heard nothing in this house, brought nothing here and bought nothing for the family, and the bashing is already here. She continued to yell, but Nancy didn't care. She felt a sharp pain in her lower abdomen, screamed C, holding onto the countertops with one hand. You're such a cunt. Her father-in-law grabbed her arm and almost dragged her toward the door. Get out of here so I don't see you again. The woman pushed Nancy out the door and slammed it shut. The girl felt the pain let go. Quietly she walked, not realizing where she was going or why. Periodically her stomach began to ache again. How long she wandered around the city, Nancy did not know. It was already dark outside, no one around. She sat down on a bench at the bus stop and only now felt very cold and some liquid running down her legs. A car passed by. She braked sharply and backed up. A guy and a girl jumped out of the car. You're sick. What's wrong with you? She's pregnant. Some fragments of phrases came to Nancy's consciousness. The guy took off his jacket, threw it over her and helped her into the car. So Nancy was taken to the maternity hospital. When Robert returned from his trip and did not find his beloved at home, he sternly asked his mother where she was. It's not enough that I don't end up with her. How do I know where that beggar's ford is? Probably where her father is. You rarely do. Shut up. Robert was furious. All the next day, he called hospitals, morgues, asked people on the street, showed the photograph. But the girl was nowhere to be found. She disappeared without a trace. Her belongings, Notebooks, books, and a purse with her passport in it were left in her room. Camille had a celebration at school. In the assembly hall, the teachers were bustling about. Back and forth, the principal started. Camille was to read a poem from the stage. She liked poems, but she didn't like to perform. She was embarrassed by the scar that the dog had left on her face. But the class teacher said that Camille should perform. She reads very heartful poetry better than anyone else, and the event is very important. The sponsors are coming. They'd donated two new computer labs to the school. Everyone and everything should enjoy it. When it was her turn to speak, Camille went on stage, stood at the microphone, looked into the hall filled with spectators. In the front row sat the principal with strangers in jackets. Camille began, Don't you love me? Don't you pity me? Am I not a little handsome? You don't look me in the face. You put your hands on my shoulders in passion. Robert suddenly looked closely at the ninth grader. Something about her was painfully familiar, dear, close. What a terrible scar. What could have happened to this girl? He remembered how once long ago, his beloved Nancy had also quietly read poetry to him. He who loved cannot love. 
He who is burned cannot be set on fire. The girl finished reading. Applause broke out in the hall. Did you like it? The principal asked Robert. Yes, she read well. And who is this girl? A very good student, kind, calm. Her parents are unlucky. Her father is a single parent. But it's hard to call it upbringing. After the concert, Peter told the head of his security service, find out everything about this girl. Everything you've heard, where she was born, who are her parents. I need any information, especially about her relative's father, mother. I also found out where she lives. Got it. I'm on it. Robert couldn't get rid of the obsession all day. A sense of deja vu. That fragile girl on stage looked a lot like his Nancy, who had disappeared without a trace 16 years ago. Toward evening, the company's head of security walked into his office. May I? Yeah. Got something on the entrance. As much as I could. But not much information. Alcoholic lives with his father. House. Conditions are bad. He's poor. He doesn't work anywhere. She sometimes moonlights as a dishwasher at a diner. The man put a piece of paper with information on it on the table. Yeah. It's got her address and date of birth. Her mother died in a car accident. And there's another interesting fact. Don't go. Don't tell. Her father is the same casino debtor you used to steal from. The man's confused. You mean the one who had his house repossessed? Robert looked at the security chief in surprise. The earth is round after all. I thought he'd never remember this loser again. Listen, let's go to Aeroflot and see how he raises his daughter. The uninvited guests found Stephen asleep. The man was wheezing on the stripped sofa. Bottles were lying around. There was a tin can with cigarette butts. Get up, loser. Robert kicked the sleeping, unshaven man in sweatpants and a t-shirt. Stephen couldn't understand anything in his sleep. Who are these people? What do they want? You don't remember me and how in my casino. I'm in debt. Well, if you drink that much, you can forget. What's your daughter's name? The frightened Stephen stared at the man looming over him. Gradually, he began to recognize in him the casino owner who had moved him into this barracks. What do you want? Listen to me. You ain't got nothing to live on. You got a good little girl. How are you going to raise her? Let her work. Let her go. The drunkard Stephen tried it, but was immediately besieged by the guard Robert and fell back on the sofa. Do you want a drink? Asked Robert. Do you have any? Stephen asked hopefully. The guest nodded, and the guard poured vodka into a dirty glass that stood next to the sofa. And now about business. I've been thinking, prices are going up, credit interest is going up too. If I count your debt now, you'll owe me three times as much. I'll have to pay you back. No, I don't have anything. Stephen's scared. What do you mean you don't have anything? And my daughter doesn't earn much washing dishes. Stephen didn't understand what Robert was getting at. It's not enough. I'll pay more. Anyway, I'm buying it from you. The man took out a bundle of bills and began slowly going through them. One thousand is enough. Stephen was amazed at the money. Or maybe two. Good, I'm kind today. Here's ten. And the girl works in my house. A. Eh? Yes. And she lives in my house too, in the maid's room. That's how Camille ended up at Robert's house. She was given a uniform of a strict blue dress and a white apron. The housekeeper showed her around the house, explained the girl's duties. Nothing special was required of her to wash, dust, clean, and keep order. The master was almost never at home, and when he came, he did not scold or hurt her, but simply went to his room. Camille felt quite comfortable. Cleanliness was always good, food plentiful. But how could her father do that to her? Sell his own daughter for $100. She's not a commodity or a slave. One day, while Camille was checking the dishes in the kitchen, Robert walked in. Can you make coffee? He asked. He seemed to be in very good spirits, but he was staring at her. Camille turned on the coffee, the machine. Say, what happened to your face? Robert suddenly asked. When I was little, a dog bit me. I was only five years old, she replied. 
intuitively covering the scar with her hand. Don't be upset, it's fixable. There's medicine now, you can do plastic surgery. I see that you are a real beauty. Your scar is nothing, but it's very expensive. I'll never make that kind of money. You don't have to make it. Camille didn't know what he meant, but in Robert's heart, it's all three. Plowing, her heart was pounding frantically. He handed her a piece of paper, something was printed on it. Robert had received the paper only today, and his happiness was unbounded. It was a kinship test between them, and the girl who reminded him so much of his Nancy, who had disappeared 16 years ago. That day they talked for a long time, sitting in the kitchen until dark. Camille could not believe what was happening. This strong, confident, and self-sufficient man is her father, and she is his own daughter. It was unbelievable and seemed like a dream. He told her everything, how he loved her mother, how she suddenly disappeared when she was pregnant, how he thought she was dead, and she died in the maternity ward. He learned all the information about the baby switch from the midwife. The woman was stubborn for a long time, but was forced to tell everything in the smallest detail. Camille underwent the operation in the capital. She was looking forward to the day when the stitches would be removed. A slight swelling was still visible on her face. It will go away soon, don't worry, the doctor said. Her father looked at her, smiling. You look so much like your mom, a real beauty. Three years passed. Camille went to university to study at the Faculty of Philosophy. She, like her late mother, also wanted to be a school teacher, and her father didn't stop her. One day, she was driving in the car to her studies. The driver was silent, watching the road intently, and she had nothing to do but listen to music with wireless headphones in her ears. Her dad had given them to her. Suddenly, the girl asked, stop, please. What's wrong? The driver got worried, but he pulled over. Camille got out of the car and walked uncertainly towards the homeless man who was sitting on the embankment. In front of him stood a cardboard box. With difficulty she recognized in the dirty, unshaven, poorly dressed man Stephen. Hello, she said, squatting down in front of him. The man looked at her with cloudy eyes. He did not recognize a well-dressed handsome man and his daughter. After a few minutes, realizing who was standing in front of him, he said, Is that you? Yes, it's me. The man suddenly lowered his head. Tears flowed from his eyes. I'm sorry, I sold you to that peddler. I acted like a pig. I'm sorry, my daughter. Don't you have any money? I really need a drink. The girl took some large bills out of her purse and put them in a cardboard box. She didn't say anything and silently returned to the car. The car started, and Camille continued to stare at this downcast man, whom she thought was her father, until he disappeared from view.